Good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm delighted to be joined by Hajon Chang, an institution economist here at the University of Cambridge, who has a particular focus on development economics. He's written many books, including um, Kicking Away the Ladder, Bad Samaritans, uh, and my personal favourite, 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. Uh, his writings have been translated into many languages, and he's also worked as a consultant to the World Bank, the Asia Development Bank, um, the European Investment Bank, Oxford and oh, Oxfam, and various UN agencies. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joel, uh, for that kind introduction. Welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, this is a strange time. You know, if it was normal time, I would be chatting to you in the uh, lovely Union building. Uh, you are you know, looking at uh, my study, and you know, and it's uh, strange uh, to talk to a screen rather than an audience, but uh, let's uh, uh, do our best uh, to make it uh, worth your time. So many things can be talked about when we are talking about the current crisis uh, caused by pandemic and its uh, likely consequences in the short term, medium term, and the long term. So I'll, I'll be very selective uh, today. I uh, would be very happy to uh, address the issues that I haven't raised because in half an hour, I cannot raise uh, that many issues. First of all, before starting, to talk about the socioeconomic consequences, let's talk about the pandemic itself. You know, I think in this country, in many uh, other countries, a false or at least avoidable trade-off has been created between health and the economy because of the mismanagement of the pandemic at the beginning. Because that, that once you let this uh, pandemic spread uh, that to a high degree, it does that, uh, become necessary to kill the economy to contain the disease. Countries that have uh, successfully contained uh, the disease through the, the public health action in the beginning have kept uh, lots of things, in some countries, most things open. So we are talking about you know, countries like Finland, South Korea, New Zealand, Taiwan, Vietnam, Thailand. Of course, uh, Thailand uh, being so reliant on the foreign tourism has been hit very hard economically, but these other countries have been able to keep uh, most things open because they uh, successfully contain the disease. So you have to uh, realize that, that uh, in today's discussion in the UK, in the US, in the, the many other European countries, although you know countries like Finland, Norway, Denmark are different, uh, there is this uh, that, uh, false trade-off uh, between economy and health eh? because it could have been different. It could have been definitely different. Yeah? I mean, if you that, that think about the scale of this uh, the health crisis, you know that the best indicator that to look at it, uh, look at is uh, the Johns Hopkins University that, that statistics. You know, per hundred thousand people, hundred and forty-seven people died of uh, COVID nineteen in Belgium. 89 people died in the UK, 83 people died in the US. But that, that, that look at the numbers for the countries that I already mentioned, it's a 15 in Denmark, seven in Finland, six in Norway, one in South Korea, 0 0.5 in New Zealand, 0 0.003 in Taiwan. So that we are talking about very different uh, uh, health crisis in different parts of the world. Although, as I said, that in relation to Thailand, the scale of a health crisis 
and the economic crisis uh, do not exactly match, you know, depending on the countries that uh, the economic structure and uh, is at the uh, international position. But that, that we have to, that I, I really want to start this uh, talk with this uh, the point that, you know, this uh, the, the, the insidious uh, the, the trade off between health and economy is a result of uh, mismanagement of the health crisis, not something that is in inevitable. Mm -hmm. Now, having that, uh, the, Having had that uh, out of the way, uh, let me talk about uh, the economic crisis uh, that is uh, sweeping the world uh, with this uh, the following on from this uh, health crisis. You know, the, the International Monetary Fund, uh, the IMF, uh, at the moment is projecting that the world economy will uh, shrink by 4.4% this year. Now, I think uh, that is a bit optimistic because uh, this projection was uh, made in October before the second wave of uh, the corona infection in Europe and North America uh, in October. So I think that uh, probably we are going to the, the, the see 5 6% contraction in the world economy this year. Put that into perspective by recalling that Following the 2008 global financial crisis, the world economy shrank only by 1%. Yeah? So this is the biggest uh, economic crisis since the Great Depression in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Yeah? Now, compared to the Great Depression, the contraction has been smaller. And people have uh, suffered less because, of course, a lot of people have suffered a lot uh, from this uh, economic crisis. But unlike the days of the Great Depression, we have the welfare state. You know, in those days, you know, countries were spending maybe three percent, maybe five percent of uh, their national output on social welfare spending. Today, in the rich countries, this ratio is at uh, 20, 30 percent, so that uh, we have an incomparably bigger welfare state. And also that uh, in this round of crisis, a lot of countries, including the UK itself, have used uh, the, a lot of uh, the public subsidies for people in unemployment, for enterprises uh, that are about to go to bankrupt uh, without state help for employment by enterprises, uh, in the sense that, that the famous follow scheme in this country, in the sense that in many countries, governments have been paying employers to keep workers on the payroll or work at a uh, reduced uh, number of hours. And, and uh, that has uh, kept a lot more people in employment than it would otherwise have been just that uh, looking at the scale of this uh, health and therefore economic crisis. Now with uh, the vaccines that are coming on stream, I mean, that is uh, that looking a bit more hopeful, but you know, there are uh, a lot of issues there, you know, that we have uh, created this uh, vaccine so quickly, we are, still not that uh, fully confident about the effectiveness of them, you know, that, that before this uh, COVID-19 vaccines, the quickest uh, vaccine development apparently took four years. Uh, so, you know, we've done the necessary clinical trial and so, but uh, we are not completely sure how effective these are going to be. And there'll be, you know, a lot of uh, the difficulties in manufacturing these uh, vaccines on large scale. And other than the Oxford, AstraZeneca vaccine, the other vaccines that uh, have uh, the shown the success require very low temperature storage, uh, which uh, will make it uh, the difficult to administer uh, them. And yeah, the, there are also big questions about the affordability of these things uh, for developing countries. So the pharmaceutical companies that have this, uh, developed these vaccines are saying, they are going to uh, uh, supply these uh, vaccines at uh, the low cost uh, to developing countries, but only during the pandemic. Yeah? 
So what happens when the WHO declares the pandemic over, because the pandemic has a pretty high threshold, there will be still a lot of uh, local infections in certain developing countries, and then they may not be able to uh, buy the vaccines uh, because they are very expensive. Yeah? Now, there's uh, a big debate on whether these uh, the vaccines uh, should be given the normal kind of uh, protection of intellectual property rights, given that uh, these companies have already received a lot of subsidies from the government uh, to develop these vaccines, given that there are actually, even within the existing very pro patent uh, system of intellectual property rights, uh, that there are provisions for suspending or weakening uh, patents for public emergencies of which this uh, pandemic is uh, the supreme example. And the rich countries have been quite willing to use this uh, when it suited them. For example, when there's a anthrax uh, scare in the United States uh, following uh, 9-11, the US uh, government wanted to stockpile the anti-anthrax uh, drug, which at the time but, uh, the, was uh, a patented drug uh, by the German the, the pharmaceutical company called Bayer, this drug Cypro uh, was uh, the, the, something that the American the government wanted to procure on a large scale, but then they found the price uh, too high. So basically, they, the, the, the American government threatened Bayer that uh, they are going to suspend the patent if uh, the, it doesn't give uh, the, a huge discount. You know? So Bayer ended up uh, giving the American government something like 80, 85% uh, discount on this drug. So that this uh, has been used. Uh, so I think that uh, we really need to keep this uh, debate going, you know, that to make this uh, vaccine affordable for everyone, you know, because that uh, we have seen, I mean, that this is a global disease. I mean, you cannot keep uh, everyone safe uh, unless you keep everyone safe, you know, never mind, I mean, although, I do mind that, that uh, never mind uh, the fact that uh, this might become unaffordable uh, for developing countries when the pandemic is uh, declared over, you know, that even the, from the self-interest uh, point of view of uh, the, the rich countries, they really need to uh, make this uh, the vaccine uh, available for everyone in the world. You know? Anyway, so that there are these uh, that, uh, health aspects, but uh, in terms of economic aspects, uh, let me bring up uh, my uh, one page slide that to give you a bit of a map of this thing. Yeah, so in terms of the consequences of the, this uh, crisis, there are some consequences that are high, uh, some changes that are highly likely and predictable, but then there are other changes that are likely but difficult to predict because it, these things require a lot of uh, the, the political debate, that the conflicts will involve a lot of conflicts and, and will require a lot of compromises uh, to work out. Yeah? And it also depends on how people uh, reconceptualize that, uh, their vision and uh, how they uh, campaign for changes, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about them a bit later, but there are some pretty predictable changes. Uh, first of all, there'll be long-term scars of this uh, economic crisis. Uh, it is well known that in any large-scale, uh, uh, so after any large-scale uh, economic crisis, the economy doesn't quite go back to its uh, old self. You know? Because uh, the drink, uh, the, you know, if one enterprise goes uh, the bankrupt, uh, you know, the few thousand workers that uh, get unemployed, uh, it doesn't leave that kind of uh, long-term scar because uh, they can be, so to speak, absorbed that uh, quite easily to the you know, broader economy. But uh, when there's uh, mass bankruptcy and mass unemployment, that uh, basically you lose a lot of things. You know, that uh, when enterprises go bankrupt, it's just not the machines that uh, go to the scrap heap and the buildings that are shut down, but the knowledge that, uh, that used to be contained in the enterprises disappear with it. Yeah? And workers are employed, uh, sorry, unemployed uh, for 
on extensive period, their skills decay. Maybe their skills are not done necessary anymore, and therefore they need to get retrained, but without you know, the government support uh, like uh, the, they give in the Scandinavian countries uh, very well, without government support, uh, it's uh, very expensive and risky for individual workers uh, to go through retraining in such of uh, new jobs. You know? So, and, and uh, while these workers are unemployed, their families will suffer, some children uh, might uh, 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 suffer from uh, the malnutrition, that they may lose uh, the educational the, the opportunities. So that this uh, the, the family of the unemployed workers uh, will the, the have uh, reduced capabilities and reduced opportunities in the, the coming years. So you know, all of these that uh, long-term scars will remain whatever the exact manner of res resolution of uh, this uh, economic crisis is. Yeah. Also, there'll be changes in the production methods that uh, we are already witnessing, uh, the changes in the way that uh, some businesses operate. Yeah. Shops are run differently, you know, the theaters and the, uh, the spectator sports are still uh, scrabbling uh, to find a ways that, that to the need uh, to keep distances, you know, which will remain that uh, for a period, even after the, the we find out that the, the vaccines are effective and we can effectively control the disease. Also, the bear in mind that this may not be the last uh, the, the pandemic that we have. You know, the, the epidemiologists and environmental scientists have been warning us for at least a couple of decades that as uh, the humanity encroaches into nature a lot of pathogens are going to jump species. You know, even before this uh, coronavirus, we have seen other coronaviruses like SARS or MERS that have jumped species, although not on the scale of this one. So the, there'll be a need to change our production method in the, a lot of activities. And that will also include the, some of the more labor intensive manufacturing where a lot of uh, workers are packed in uh, packed densely in small spaces and practically working on top of each other. So, for example, in the U.S., in Germany, it uh, uh, turned out that the meat processing factories were hotbeds of uh, the, the coronavirus infection because you know the, that's where a lot of people work in very small space are to work on meat. Uh, <clears throat> the animals uh, to turn them into the meat products. Yeah? There will be also changes in consumption structure. I think that uh, it's already happening. You know, uh, we are demanding less uh, the, the services. You know, the, we uh, have changed uh, the way that we live our lives uh, already considerably. Some of them will go back to the old ways. Some of them will ch change uh, the, the more permanently. Yeah? So, you know, the demand for services will decline compared to those for physical goods uh, because it's uh, easier to uh, keep the hygiene standard with the uh, physical goods and services. Yeah? And then demand for certain types of manufactured goods that, uh, which make it uh, easier that, uh, to cope with these uh, the, the restrictive conditions like uh, electronics products, and healthcare products are, are going to rise, you know, I mean, just to put it crudely, you know, maybe you have been saving money to go and uh, visit Machu Picchu in Peru. And now you know that, I, that, that there's no way you can go there in the next uh, three, four years, especially Peru having been one of the most uh, hard hit uh, countries in the world. So uh, maybe we'll buy the, a new the display screen to, to see Machu Picchu at least uh, the, the virtually uh, in higher resolution. Yeah? There'll be also reorganizations of the global supply chains. So the, with the start of the pandemic in China, I mean, actually a lot of factories stopped in other countries, even though they were not at that point infected with the virus because uh, the, they needed the uh, inputs uh, from China to build things, you know. So for example, when uh, China shut down uh, in January, February due to coronavirus, uh, 
car factories in South Korea and Germany stopped, you know, because they uh, couldn't get uh, these parts uh, from China. So that a lot of people have realized that the fragility of the so-called global value chains, and uh, there are some attempts to reorganize uh, this, but it's not going to be easy. You know, I mean, there are reasons why China is uh, producing so many of these things because it's a very efficient producer. Yeah? I mean, the, the, some people in the UK and the US uh, have uh, talked about so-called reshoring of manufacturing, you know, bringing back uh, production home. But uh, this uh, that thing cannot happen that easily, you know. I mean, especially in countries like the UK and the US, uh, the domestic uh, manufacturing ecosystem has been destroyed so much that uh, you know, Apple cannot just, uh, bring production of iPhone back uh, uh, to the US uh, from China yeah? because uh, they don't have the supply network, they don't have the necessary infrastructure, you know, they don't have uh, the, the skilled workers. So it's uh, going to be difficult, but uh, there'll be some attempts to reorganize uh, the supply chains because you know, people have realized that uh, the old system, well, rather the pre uh, corona system, but that uh, might have been very efficient, but it was very fragile yeah, because the, everything had to work perfectly for it to achieve its uh, maximum efficiency. Yeah? So these are kind of changes that, that uh, are likely to happen, but there are other changes that uh, we, uh, I think uh, that we might be seeing. So first of all, now we are moving to the right-hand column. We, there will be expansion and reorganization of the role of the government. You know, through this pandemic, a lot of uh, economic orthodoxy has been destroyed. You know, the Trump administration, which I mean, basically regards uh, giving uh, money to poor people a crime, had to send these checks at, uh, to poor people because otherwise uh, the economy would collapse. You know? The German government, famous for its uh, fiscal conservatism, suspended the ceiling on public debt. You know? The UK and many other governments are that, that paying firms to keep workers on the payroll. You know? and the, debt is, uh, the, the public debt is climbing to I mean, levels not seen uh, since the Second World War. Although on this uh, debt issue, you, know, that you have to remember that if the government doesn't run debt in this kind of crisis. Individuals and companies will have to run debt. Yeah, so it's not as if you know that there are some fiscal hawks uh, who worry about government debt, but that uh, you know this is uh, not a time to worry about it. I mean, this is a, a, a systemic crisis. You know, can you imagine you know, that the US or the UK are saying, "Ah, oh, we are going to stop fighting Hitler because uh, the." That we are worried about uh, budget deficit. So it's uh, that kind of situation. And if the government doesn't run that, uh, individuals and companies will have to run that, then they have uh, much higher chances of going bankrupt than the government. And therefore, uh, actually, uh, it uh, 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 even makes uh, economic sense uh, for the government to run that. Yeah? So that uh, I urge you not to be kind of, uh, worried about uh, this uh, uh, public debt issue, at least in the way that, that, that you are supposed to by the, the, the fiscal hawks. Yeah? There'll be welfare and labor reform, but especially you know, the, in this crisis, we have realized that unless <clears throat> everyone is safe, no one is safe. You know, that, that in countries with that, that weaker welfare state and uh, fewer labor rights, that, that people had to you know, go out that, uh, even if uh, they were uh, they knew that they were infected by the virus because they don't have but uh, that the uh, sick pay you know, that uh, they'll be sacked uh, if they don't uh, the turn up for work yeah? and yeah that, that this contributed uh, to the spread of disease also throughout this uh, the <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> 
through this uh, crisis, uh, the, even countries uh, that have a uh, decent welfare state, uh, good welfare state, have realized that there are a lot of uh, gaps, yeah? because uh, with the increasing uh, share of uh, labor force in the so, so-called uh, gig economy, a lot of people are not actually covered uh, by the existing welfare uh, arrangement. Yeah? In most countries, self-employed people are very poorly covered by the welfare state. And uh, you know, uh, these people are very hard hit that, uh, by uh, this uh, pandemic because a lot of them are running you know, small restaurants and shops that, uh, which uh, had to close that, uh, during the uh, pandemic. So you know, a lot of countries are talking about that, uh, strengthening the welfare state and reforming uh, labor rights, uh, basically strength, strengthening it. And yeah, there should be and could be, but will not necessarily be resetting of social priorities. You know, the, one very interesting thing happened in this crisis. You know, in the UK, these people are called essential, uh, sorry, key workers. In the US, they were called essential employees, people who work in the health sector, care homes, people working in food production and food processing, education, grocery stores, uh, delivery services, you know, people without whom the society cannot uh, survive. Yeah? And we've also realized that, 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 that women have been doing huge amount of uh, the unpaid care work and household work without which uh, the society cannot uh, reproduce itself. Yeah? So a lot of uh, that, that, that people have realized that, that this uh, the reproductive economy or the care economy is uh, vital for survival of uh, the, the society. But then the curious thing is that, 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 that these are sectors exactly where most people, except for medical doctors, are hugely underpaid. Yeah? But uh, in the last uh, few decades, we have been constantly told by pro-market economists that you know, the market should be ultimate arbiter of how valuable each individual is that, that as a worker that, that to society. So if uh, someone's pay, being paid a lot of money, it must be because uh, that person's uh, very useful for society. In this crisis, uh, we have uh, that, uh, realized that you know, without uh, nurses, without uh, the delivery people, the society collapsed you know, without the investment bankers, well, I mean, the, the, the society wouldn't collapse. Yeah? Maybe it will become different. That, uh, maybe it will become you know, less uh, the, 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 the efficient in the narrow sense, uh, but uh, the, you know, the society will survive. Yeah? So actually, the, now we are forced uh, to rethink uh, the way we have been setting social priorities, yeah? because uh, the market economics have uh, told us that uh, there should be no kind of, uh, mechanism, extra economic mechanism to determine value of things. Yeah? I mean, let uh, the market decide, let uh, the people decide uh, the, through their wallet, although uh, the, not through the, their votes, what are more important. Yeah? If uh, people are willing to pay more for some things, then uh, it must be that those things are more important. Yeah? Now we have to think differently. Yeah? We have to th 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 create a mechanism to set or rather reset our social priorities and have to create a system where markets are an important part of uh, the, the, the setting these uh, priorities, but that uh, shouldn't be the only part. Yeah? And finally, I think uh, that this uh, the pandemic might, although once again, uh, not necessarily will, that uh, bring about the uh, reorganization of uh, global economic and political order. For one thing, for various reasons I cannot go into, you know, developing countries, except outside Latin America, are going to suffer less at, uh, from this uh, pandemic, especially the Asian developing countries, are, except for India, are going to do relatively well. So the shift of uh, the gravity of uh, the global economic center to the east that has been going on in the last uh, few decades 
will accelerate, thereby giving more uh, weight uh, to developing economies and thereby greater voices uh, that for them in the international uh, the fora. Yeah? But also, the, I think that uh, you know the, this was already implied by the, the numbers I gave by in the beginning. You know that we have in this crisis seen many of the leading uh, the, the rich countries completely bungling up uh, the, the pandemic management and the economic uh, the, and the economy compared to you know some of the poorest ones are uh, like Vietnam, uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, you know, Thailand, and uh, that, and and this is actually creating uh, the, a re-examination in developing countries of their, if you like, uh, inferiority complex towards these rich countries, many of whom used to be, you know, the, the, their colonial masters. Yeah? Yeah, so the, I'm uh, from a developing country, that, uh, or what was a developing country, South Korea. And uh, the, you know, a lot of people still do, but certainly when we are a poor country, we have always uh, thought the Americans are most uh, efficient people that are uh, in the world. The Brits uh, have the best institutions. The French somehow epitomize uh, the, the highest achievement of uh, human culture. But then these countries have but, uh, shown to be the completely the, the, the inept. And yeah, really, you get to ask uh, how these countries who claim to be you know, the bearers of but, uh, human civilization be so kind of blasé about that. that having so many people die from this uh, the mismanagement. Yeah? You know, that, don't forget, the Americans that, that, that started two wars uh, after 9-11, that, uh, in which uh, that, that 3,000 people died. Yeah? I mean, that now that uh, more than a quarter of a million Americans have died from this disease. And yeah, I mean, of course, uh, they're upset, but uh, they uh, don't seem to be even remotely upset about that, that this uh, that, as uh, that what uh, how they were uh, after 9-11. I mean, this is uh, that, I mean, kind of uh, mismanagement of this uh, pandemic by the rich countries is uh, really making uh, developing countries rethink uh, their inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis these countries. And yeah, it's uh, not going to be a quick uh, thing, but that uh, uh, in the long run, this will that uh, change uh, the the way they perceive uh, the current uh, global the, the political and economic order. And I think uh, that that could bring about that uh, quite uh, significant changes uh, in the long run. Okay, let me stop there and uh, take some questions and comments uh, because the whole point of uh, this was uh, the, an interaction rather than a one way. Uh, delivery. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. I, I think I'll start with a question that touches on the last point you mentioned. Uh, it's a question from Danny and it relates to the relationship between developing and developed countries. Um, and he's asking about um, the, the, the cost and benefit of, of globalisation and if the economic impact on developing countries hasn't been directly due to COVID but rather indirectly via a global slump in demand. Mm. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about um, the kind of interdependency uh, between developed and developing countries. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, of course, uh, when I say developing countries, uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, vast areas of the world and yeah, some developing countries have suffered even more than uh, Britain or the US uh, in terms of this pandemic, you know, Peru, Ecuador, you know, qu quite a few Latin American countries. So that, that it's been very varied. And yeah, also that, that you know, some people say, oh, maybe that they don't have uh, such good uh, statistics. Uh, some of those governments are dictatorial and uh, therefore don't want to uh, uh, be transparent. But, you know, I think uh, there's a limit to what uh, you can do even if you are one of the most uh, horrendous uh, dictatorial regimes in terms of 
hiding information these days, you know, that, so that uh, even if Vietnam shrank uh, that uh, is at uh, death rate by 100%, it's uh, still four people out of 100,000 people, you know? which is still only one twentieth of what you have in the US or the UK. And yeah? so you know, that th there is some issue with uh, data collection, but that, that you know, the differences are rather stark. But yeah, the, there are factors that uh, are in favor of uh, developing countries. They, in general, have a younger population. Yeah? So that, that they are more that, that resistant that, that, that to the virus and, you know, some countries that uh, do not have a cold climate, uh, which uh, increases uh, the chances of infection. So and I'm not saying that it was entirely that, that, that due to kind of organization abilities and health management, but uh, yeah, there's no question that, that, that this has uh, that had uh, very different effects across uh, different countries. Now, however, yeah, I mean, that we now live in a very globalized world. You know, Thailand might have been one of the most uh, successful Economies in terms of uh, pandemic management, but uh, it's uh, economies that are that, that tanking yeah? because it has been very reliant on international tourism, and there are very few tourists that are going there. Yeah? And that, that you know, that you know, I already told you about uh, German and Korean car factories stopping when the Chinese uh, economy was shut down. Yeah? So. Yeah, I mean, uh, we basically have to uh, uh, realize that uh, now the world is uh, yeah, not yet politically, but economically that uh, one community. And this uh, has to be managed uh, on a global scale. I mean, you cannot have this uh, kind of uh, the parochial approach uh, out as far as our people have yeah? uh, the vaccines that uh, will be okay. No, you won't be okay because you are not going to get that uh, your uh, uh, mobile phones are from South Korea and uh, uh, China, you know? you're not going to uh, uh, have uh, uh, reliable supplies of uh, uh, food items are from Asia and uh, uh, Latin America. So yeah, I mean, that uh, this uh, really requires uh, a global thinking. And I think uh, it will be a good thing that uh, uh, given the biggest challenge that uh, the humanities are facing, namely climate change. Yeah? That requires also this uh, global approach. Yeah? I mean, the nationalism has uh, that, uh, I mean, maybe a little bit, but uh, no place uh, in the, the, the management of uh, climate change. So let's uh, use this as an opportunity to really to, to, to equip uh, people with a global perspective. Yeah? Hey, thank you. A question that's coming from Tom. Tom's curious to hear your thoughts on whether governments, if at all, will be able to, will be able to combat their ever-increasing government debt to GDP ratios. Um, with a low growth, low inflation future for many economies, it seems very difficult to get out of the cycle, um, which Tom, Tom thinks COVID-19 has accentuated this issue. What future government actions do you think are crucial um, to be able to structurally reduce their government to debt, uh, GDP, jet, government debt to GDP ratios. Yeah. Yes, uh, the, no, the, uh, in the saying that uh, this is not the time to worry about that, the uh, public debt, uh, the, I wasn't implying that uh, the, it's not going to be an issue ever. No, it will become an issue when the, the pandemic is uh, brought under control and uh, the economy uh, begins to rebound, but that, uh, when you are talking about that, this uh, scale of that, really the only way to that, uh, reduce it is that, uh, by the, uh, kind of growing faster than trying to cut spending because that, uh, you know, this has already been tried uh, after the 2008 global the, the financial crisis, you know, a lot of countries Spain, Italy, Portugal, Greece, they were forced uh, to cut uh, public spending. And, you know, they were not able to reduce that uh, debt to GDP ratio, despite that, because their GDP was uh, stagnant or shrinking. Yeah? Because that, uh, you have to realize that, 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 that government spending is part of GDP. Yeah? And it has a lot of uh, that, uh, what economists call multiplier effects. Yeah? 
it doesn't just uh, stop at government spending less. Uh, it has uh, that uh, knock-on effect on, you know, basically that the most important uh, principle in managing the macroeconomy is that my spending is your income. Yeah? So that, that it may be prudent uh, for individuals uh, to cut spending in that, that, that recession, but if everyone did that, I mean, that, that everyone that will have that, that even less income, yeah? So that's why government uh, intervenes at, uh, during uh, big economic recessions to keep up the spending, keep the demand uh, going, yeah? even if it means uh, increasing public debt. Yeah? So for example, after the Second World War, that, that Britain had the public debt to GDP ratio close to 200%. Yeah? I mean, way, way above but, uh, what we are going to get after the uh, coronavirus, yeah? but it uh, didn't uh, try to cut it by that, that reducing spending. It actually that, that, that cut it by spending money in areas uh, which will encourage uh, economic growth, yeah? which will that, that, that basically make the that, uh, GDP bigger so that uh, debt to GDP ratio, even if the debt itself is uh, that's still high, will fall and yeah, they did it over two, three decades. Yeah? So I think uh, that uh, we have to learn the uh, lessons uh, from history. Yeah? That's how you manage this kind of mega scale debt. Yeah? I mean, the, the, the kind of debt that, that cannot be managed by, you know, I don't know, three years of uh, austerity policy, yeah? because it's that, that totally out of whack. Yeah? So the, I think that, that, that we have to think like that, you know, this is, I mean, that was, you know, really once in a century kind of uh, economic crisis. Yeah? And we need to that, 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 that come up with a once in a century kind of uh, solution. We cannot think uh, in the normal way because that uh, if, I mean, uh, any, uh, by any chance that uh, if uh, governments uh, all try to kind of cut uh, their uh, public debt uh, quickly uh, within, three to five years of uh, the end of this uh, pandemic, the whole global uh, demand will collapse and uh, we are all going to be in uh, even worse uh, situations. Um, and a question that's come in that's quite linked to that answer is from Jonah. And it relates to whether or not you think perhaps in a, in a British context, increased government spending will stay much like the post-World War II settlement where the electorate became comfortable with higher spending. Um, yeah. Do you think that this scenario is analogous to that one in parts? No, no, very much. I mean, uh, there's a big parallel with that. Yeah? I mean, once again, uh, to repeat that, you know, the kind of uh, the scale of debt uh, that to GDP ratio that we are going to get uh, after this pandemic is not something that uh, you can solve with uh, normal solutions. Yeah. I mean, the that, that same with the that, that, uh, Second World War, you know, it was you know, the biggest war in the human history. You know? Britain especially had to run huge debt that, that, to fight it. You know? And yeah, that, that when you have uh, that gone through this uh, that, that unique uh, experience, uh, you need uh, unique solutions. Yeah? You cannot uh, manage it uh, in the normal way. I mean, the government debt increase a bit, you know, let's uh, uh, tighten the belt uh, for a few years and then uh, we will be back to the normal situation. If you try to reduce uh, this kind of debt uh, quickly, it will actually create uh, a macroeconomic uh, uh, avalanche. Yeah? A question that's come in from Marco is whether or not you think there will be a V-shaped recovery after the vaccine rollout, I suppose, um, probably not. But, but yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, V-shaped, uh, I don't think uh, anyone's at, uh, at, uh, predicting V-shaped recovery anymore. Yeah? Uh, but yeah, a lot will depend on the, the exact shape of uh, the recovery will uh, depend a lot on the effectiveness of uh, vaccines yeah? and also how many people are going to take the vaccine. Yeah? So if uh, that, uh, somehow these are not very effective if uh, that, 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 that a large proportion of people for whatever good and bad reasons uh, refuse to uh, take the vaccines, then that the disease uh, wouldn't be controlled. And then that, that you will keep having the same problem. Yeah? So that, that's one, but 
you know, uh, as I said earlier, I mean, when you have this uh, kind of huge uh, that, that, uh, economic crisis that lasts uh, for months and years, you know, the economy will uh, not come back uh, to its uh, old self uh, quickly. You know? So that, that I, I, I don't think that, that anyone's uh, now predicting that the uh, V-shaped uh, recovery. Um, a question from Dana um, asks you to talk us through the role for organizations such as the IMF and World Bank uh, in combating the economic impacts of this crisis. Mm. Well, these uh, multilateral uh, financial institutions uh, like the IMF, uh, that is the uh, International Monetary, F Monetary Fund and the World Bank, they were basically set up uh, to help countries go through difficult uh, short-term uh, crisis without uh, having to compromise uh, their uh, long-term uh, development uh, prospects. Yeah? So this is exactly the time and that uh, these uh, institutions have to increase their lending. You know, actually, we have seen some of that already. Yeah? They have to broker the, the restructuring of uh, debt by developing countries. They might uh, the, the even want to the broker some uh, the debt cancellation as they did uh, back in the early 2000s uh, for heavily indebted countries. Yeah, you know, the, basically the, these organizations uh, need to help countries that uh, do not have uh, so-called hard currency. Yeah? I mean, the US, of course, the EU, yeah, with euro, to a lesser extent, that uh, uh, Britain with the uh, pound sterling, Japan with that uh, uh, yen, yeah, even increasingly China with the uh, renminbi. You know, these are countries that are able to issue currencies that other people, at least some other people, will accept. Yeah? So if uh, they get into the financial the, the, the trouble, they get into economic crisis, they have some room for maneuver. Yeah? I mean, Americans have a lot of room for maneuver. They can just print a lot of money and solve uh, many problems. But countries without hard currency, you know, the, no one's that are going to accept Vietnamese dong, you know, no one's that are going to accept uh, Peruvian peso you know, if uh, that, uh, you run out of uh, that, uh, your foreign currency and uh, try to pay other people with, with, with your money. You know? So these countries need uh, liquidity injection. Many of them will also need uh, debt restructuring. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, those organizations have been set up for exact, uh, the, 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 exactly for those purposes. Unfortunately, they haven't acted that, uh, like that, that uh, for quite a while. I mean, they used to do that a lot until the 70s. And then in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, they were actually not doing that kind of thing. But they have uh, slowly recovered uh, their old mission. And I hope uh, that this time around that uh, they do more. A slightly light-hearted question has come in from Sally, which is, which three economists would you recommend the British government reads when formulating their response to the economic crisis in light of the pandemic? Oh, economic crisis, uh, three economists. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would uh, say, the, yeah, it's uh, the, the, the quite a kind of a disparate uh, group, but I would say the Karl Marx, John Maynard Keynes, and uh, for a more modern person, uh, Joseph Stiglitz. I mean, they, they have all uh, written about uh, the sy systemic causes of uh, the economic crisis in the capitalist economies. They have, of course, uh, very different uh, political views, uh, very different uh, the goals and so on. But uh, yeah, the, those people, I think, uh, uh, are probably the best uh, read uh, in times like this. And a similar question from Diane, which, which country's response to the, in terms of economic policy to um, COVID have you found most compelling? Uh, well, as I said, you know, the, the economic uh, policy response and health policy response in this case are not two separate things. Yeah? So the most uh, important economic uh, policy was to contain the disease. Yeah? You know, I mean, no less about other countries, but uh, you go to you know, the South Korea, you go to the, the Finland, 
you know, most things are open, yeah? Exactly because that, that they have been able to control the disease, yeah? So, you know, the South Korea recently had a spike uh, from, I don't know, 100 cases per day to 500. You know, <laughs> I mean, in Britain, you're celebrating that, that uh, the number is so low, but that, that uh, 500 is uh, considered a crisis in the country. And they decided to, I read uh, from Korean newspapers, uh, to close uh, things like uh, saunas, you know, which I that, that, that didn't think was uh, possible to that, uh, remain open, that uh, even in that uh, low infection climate. So, that, you know, if you control the disease, you can actually that, that keep the economy going. So that it is uh, predicted this year that the Korean economy is uh, going to shrink only by like uh, 1%, maybe 1.5%, yeah? instead of 9, 10% that, that, that uh, you will see in the countries like the US and uh, the UK. Yeah? So that, that, that's the first point. I mean, that, that getting the health that, 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 that policy right is the best uh, economic policy. But secondly, uh, having controlled the uh, health that uh, I think uh, you know, that the Scandinavian countries have uh, coped uh, the best uh, because they uh, have uh, a very well-functioning welfare state and uh, with that, uh, they have been able to minimize uh, the negative impacts of uh, the, this uh, crisis on the people's uh, livelihood. Unfortunately, given how well they managed uh, the, the health crisis, uh, uh, South Korea hasn't uh, been great with economic policy because it has a very small welfare state. You know, the, it spends uh, only about 10, 11 percent of uh, GDP on social welfare compared to 20 percent of uh, OECD average, yeah? and 30 uh, percent or thereabout uh, for countries like France and the Scandinavian countries. Yeah? So a lot of people that, uh, given the size of uh, uh, negative eco economic impacts of this crisis, they have suffered quite a lot because uh, especially self-employed people who account for 25% of uh, Korean population, uh, sorry, Korean workforce, they have very little the, the coverage in terms of unemployment insurance and other mm -hmm. income support. Uh, so, you know, basically it uh, shows that, that uh, rather than, you know, immediate uh, but, uh, macroeconomic responses, the most uh, the, the effective uh, weapon against uh, the, the, this crisis has been a good uh, welfare state. Uh, question from Hassan, which might have to be our last question. Um, have any countries successfully learned the lessons of the 2008 crash? Haha. <laughs> <laughs> I am afraid uh, no country has uh, done that uh, because, uh, you know, at the beginning of that uh, crisis, uh, we all thought that uh, the world economy, especially the financial system, will be fundamentally reformed, but it hasn't happened, uh, partly because uh, the, of the lobbying by the financial industry, but also because uh, the, you know, people who basically benefit uh, from the old system have managed uh, to kind of, uh, convince uh, the rest of the population that uh, the most important thing is uh, to control the public debt. But actually, you know, that, that those public debts after the 2008 financial crisis happened exactly because of the crisis. Yeah? Basically, those uh, that, uh, debts were mainly created because the government uh, had large deficit coming mainly from the fall in tax receipt, not because they increased spending very much. Yeah? So the, that uh, has uh, led to this uh, austerity drive in many countries. But then the kind of uh, downward uh, pressure on the economy because of uh, austerity was uh, uh, countered not by restructuring uh, spending and increasing it uh, that, that to improve uh, the long-term uh, growth and uh, productivity improvement, it was that, uh, mainly dealt with by basically releasing a lot of money, you know, the so-called quantitative easing. You know? So, you know, I, I liken the effect of 
uh, sorry, likened the quantitative easing to someone shouting, I'm thirsty, and someone else that they're coming to that person and pouring a bucket of water. Yeah, so that person might get a mouthful of water, but a lot of water has been wasted because that, that, that's what has happened with all the liquidity released by this uh, the, the quantitative easing, trillions of dollars, much of which is sitting in bank balance and not reaching the productive uh, the enterprises, not reaching ordinary people. So yeah, I'm afraid that uh, it has been that, uh, completely mismanaged. And you know, I really hope that uh, we learn the, the better from this uh, the crisis. I mean, it has been so much more difficult actually, be exactly because it came while the crisis, at the previous crisis hadn't been resolved. You know? Do not forget that we have uh, lived with an unprecedentedly low interest rate yeah, for over a decade. Yeah? No, this is absurd. You know, I mean that the uh, interest rate uh, these days uh, the, is like you know, the base rate is like zero point five percent, one percent, one point five percent. Yeah, this is the lowest ever since uh, that in the history of uh, capitalism. There's something wrong there, yeah? and. Yeah, we were then uh, hit by you know, this uh, the, the pandemic and uh, another crisis, and we'll be hit by climate change. And yeah, I really uh, hope uh, that uh, the, uh, the humanity uh, gets its uh, acts together uh, quickly so that uh, we can deal with all these uh, the major crises that uh, are hitting us and making a lot of uh, people's lives uh, very difficult. Um, on that note, thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to us tonight. Um, particularly as a non-economist, I feel I've learned so much. Um, and we'd, re we'd definitely love to have you back in the um, physical union, uh, as well as the yes, virtual one. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. When we reopen shortly. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions and joined us on the live stream. You can recap this event and all of our other events on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Take care and have a great night.